Welcome to another episode of Capital Spotlight. Today we have Richard Wilson, founder and CEO of Family Office Club. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Very cool. So to start off, just provide a little background for those of uh, listeners that aren't familiar with you. Sure. So uh, I started the Family Office Club 13 years ago, and the Family Office is an ultra wealthy you know, wealth management solution or financial solution. Um, we have 2,000 registered investors in the Family Office Club. We also have about 800 registered subscribers who kind of pay to be a member because they're raising capital or something. Um, but out of those 2,000 registered investors, we have 207 that have signed our agreement to give us a little performance fee from the investor when we place their capital into something. So we're like the opposite of a capital raiser. We're like an investor allocator and we don't do traditional wealth management. We help families get into direct investments. That's the cleanest way of describing how we serve the investors. And then the family office club is just around to make the whole industry more transparent. You know, what is a family office? How do they operate? How do you start one? How do you raise capital from one, et cetera? Yeah, it's a really good space. And I'm, so I'm glad to have you on the show just because we've been talking with private equity funds, opportunity funds, uh, more so things like that, especially surrounded around the commercial real estate space. So getting cool. your insight on a lesser known and more potentially difficult to navigate part of the, you know, the capital raising sector uh, is valuable. So to start, let's talk about today, coronavirus and, and how you have been seeing deals get done in this environment and, and how you see the, the best way to position yourself to raise capital in this environment. Yeah, sure. So we've closed on eight investments for 15.8 million since February 20th. Um, we have right now a $500,000 investment pending to close on the 30th this month. We also have a term sheet for 5 million and the first million is supposed to come in on Monday next week. Uh, and then we've got another 100,000 pending on a deal. And what we found is more activity now than 12 months ago, uh, but on certain types of assets. So it's tough news if you're in commercial real estate that unless you have something really excellent, high conviction, and somehow you found one of the distressed deals out there, a lot of commercial real estate hasn't repriced yet and institutional quality size assets haven't really repriced yet. And maybe they won't. If the recovery goes well enough, people will bridge that gap and kind of beat it. But some people who got hit really hard, obviously hospitality, maybe some office parks, some of them, there are deals right now and people are willing to listen to that and move forward. But many investors don't know what to make of the fact that the stock market seems very expensive despite the economy being poor. Uh, real estate doesn't seem to have repriced across the board despite the economy being poor and you know, 30 million people unemployed. But there's pockets of opportunity and we have a family office club member closing a, a $28 million multifamily deal right now. We uh, just got off the call with a $100 million net worth client of ours. Uh, we have clients that are worth one or two million and then we have clients that are 100 million and a lot of clients in between. The average net worth is 28 million. So I don't want people to think we're only working with people that are ridiculously wealthy. But we just got off the phone with a group because there's a self storage firm that we have originated debt for in the past. They have 100 million in assets. But they're looking for someone to come in uh, for $20 million equity check and basically be a co-GP kind of JV partner on seven of their self-storage properties. And so um, it's not a deal we're shopping around to people. It's not a deal I'm hired to raise capital for. So it's not a you know, solic solicitation for securities or anything. It's just a, a case study of what gets a family office very excited. They're able to come in, negotiate custom terms, take out and recap a bunch of small investors. And then meanwhile, that sponsor gets to a, recap out a whole bunch of small investors that put in 25, 75K at a time, get them a decent return. And now all those investors that had a good experience might come into their next seven deals. So it helps them grow. And then that same family office might come into the next seven deals. So those types of deals are, are highly interesting. And um, give you one more example of something that's gone well is uh, in the life settlements investment fund space. It's an investment fund, alternative investment, not based on real estate or companies, private companies. And it has been gone, going well because it provides a 7 to 15% return. It's not correlated to everything else. So when people don't know what to make of public markets, they don't know what to make of real estate, they're like, oh, here's something that's kind of strange I didn't know existed. And, and they've been doubling down on that. We've had the most allocations in that um, 
versus everything else. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, definitely pursuing uncorrelated or less correlated investments like life settlements makes a lot of sense right now. So, and, and are those strategies attracting family offices that historically have invested in real estate, for example, and are pursuing that or, or are they just already familiar with the space? You know, so what's attracting them? Yeah, all types of families. No one's familiar with the space. We've had some real estate families, some dentist and doctors, uh, some operating business tech families. It has a general appeal, um, just like real estate is a general appeal. Um, the, the other thing that's been attracting investors is something with income with quality collateral behind it. And so what we've been doing is taking an operating business that has steady revenue, a million, two, three, four, five million in revenue, and turning it into an income investment. Instead of investing for equity and having your capital locked up for a decade and maybe you get distributions and maybe the company goes sideways or just never sells, um, instead of doing that, we structure it as a gross revenue royalty. So investors get one to two times their money back off the table so they can recycle that cash into the next deal after three to four and a half years typically. The money is completely off the table. And then the, the royalty continues um, or the royalty stops and their equity piece you know, goes down once all the capital is off the table. So in one deal, it's a healthcare subscription company. It's 80% subscription revenue, 4.5 million a year in revenue. The CEO is like, hey, I need to do this capital raise. I can't get debt to do it, so I'm gonna go get equity. But he believes this company is gonna be worth $100 million. Well, instead of giving away 15% equity in this company, he can structure it as a royalty, give investors double their money back, and instead of selling 15% equity, he does that. But after you get double your money back, then your equity spot goes down for that group of investors, down to 5% from 15, or down to two from 15. So you get a little kicker in case he sells for 100 million, but you already doubled your money, you got the money he needed. And there's, there's different ways to play with that equation to make it work with royalties. Sounds like an attractive st structure. And I think that's one thing that I want to discuss with you is the idea that family offices require you know, better treatment, better terms than just the typical investor. They want to know that they're getting the special treatment because well, I think for various reasons, right? They see themselves as being value added by being able to come in with a larger check, or maybe they have some in network or other ways that they can create value for the company. So, you know, is that number one, is that true? And then how do you see that playing out in something like life settlements or, or other asset classes? You know, what is that better special treatment look like? Yeah, sometimes it's a uh, special access or insight or knowledge or structure. Like with life settlements, their banker never brought it to them. No one's ever mentioned it to them in their life. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Thanks, Richard. Okay, we'll do that for you. Um, with a chain of dental clinics we're structuring a deal with, it's the fact that it's a steady business they can understand and the royalty structure makes it feel special. With the self-storage recap portfolio, the portfolio is relatively stabilized. There's some upside to sell it to a REIT one day, but it's not a super sexy return, but it might be a 12% IRR. But most people promise 15 to 17% or 15 to 20 in deals. And so to make it more attractive, we're customizing the fees. We're also giving the family office first right of refusal to invest on any of their future deals and take up to 50% of the deal on reduced terms, maybe performance fee only, or very handsome terms. So if the deal goes well, they pay their due in fees, but they're not paying a lot of acquisition management fees. So that's how we're making the deal more attractive is um, by giving them first right rolling forward because it's gonna transform the self-storage sponsor. It's a huge win for them. And um, bringing that up proactively helps my client thinking about all the angles. I've got an excellent uh, securities attorney and on almost every call where we're negotiating the terms, he'll be on the call so that afterwards we can debrief and think of two or three smart moves or things to do so if the deal, the deal breaks, we have a couple backup investors. Like that type of value add, I think is really what families are looking for and they kind of take notice of that. I like that. So taking a step back to just speak generally about family offices, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, of raising capital and partnering with a family office as a sponsor? Yeah, so disadvantage is that the space is confusing. People can sometimes be like, hey, it's, it's just so hard. People don't call me back when I call them. You know, if you don't, people always say you have to work through your network. I don't have a network. That's why I'm coming to Family Office Club to try to figure this out. And capital raising is always harder than everyone expects. It takes longer. It's more of a grind. 
if it was easy, then I wouldn't be, I would just raise a hundred billion dollars and be on a beach somewhere and wouldn't be doing interviews like this, right? No offense, but like I, I have my own podcast too and I do interviews, so I value them. But like, it's not easy for anyone. And I've been working 13 years to grow the family office club and we're getting better at putting deals together. We're getting great traction and great progress. That's very hard for everyone. So the disadvantage is that they're hard to find. The advantage is that one family office can literally replace 200 small investors. You know, in this case with a $20 million recap, they're, they're recapping, you know, 80 some investors with one investor. Another advantage is that I'm on the board of a real estate development company uh, out of Nashville that has 250 million in assets. When they came to our first conference, they didn't really know what a family office was, and then they learned. And then they met a few family offices through our network, but by chance, the ones who invested were from outside of our network. But because of the knowledge they gained with just three investors closed and using co-GP strategies, they've grown to 250 million in assets with three investors. You know, that wouldn't be possible with like a $1 million net worth investors. So that's the advantage. It can add up quickly. They can open their network. They can add strategic value. Sometimes they'll sign on the balance sheet to get the debt approved. They can open big doors and credibility and be a seed investor and anchor investor. Um, and that, that can be very helpful. But on the downside, um, the bigger the check size, the longer you're going to have to build trust, maybe the more in person, the lower fees, or just more aligned fees. Family offices don't mind paying the price of a Rolls Royce. They just don't want to get a Honda Civic with no air conditioning. So like they want it, like if you do well, then you should get paid well. But if all you've done is tied up my money, why should I pay you this huge management fee, big acquisition fee? I can put my money anywhere. So you've tell you've done something of value with my money. You haven't earned the fees yet. You just tied up my money. So um, everybody wants their money. They have a lot of leverage. That's the downside. You know, you, it's not going to be golf club terms of like, oh, 50% performance fee and 3% acquisition fee. And, you know, um, it's got to be terms that a sophisticated, intelligent investor would say, okay, that's worth the value. I see what you're doing. Definitely makes sense. So you said you have to drive through your network. And I think you're one of the best in the business, certainly in the family office space in terms of a network. I forget the number that you brag about in terms of how many you know, family offices you've met with and have relationships right. with and billion dollar families, which, you know, obviously are great accomplishments. What, you know, just give us the quick, you know, obviously it's not a quick, it's a grind, it's a long process, but you know, how does somebody set off on that path towards finding family offices? Yeah, it's very much connected to a mistaken mentality people have when they come to family office clubs. So every week we do virtual investor discussion panels. Every day we do a Zoom interview with an investor and release that. In the portal, we have 600 video interviews with investors saying what they want to invest in. Back in the real world, when we can host events, we did 25 live events per year, many investor summit. So you can meet real investors through the family office club for sure. Those are all the different ways. The mistake people make is thinking that that's the real value. It's like, that's not the real value. It's hearing after 13 years, what is going to make it less painful to your question? Everyone comes saying, Hey, you have a couple of fish for me. Is there a fish over here that I can have for lunch? Or like, can you, Richard, you know, all these people just refer to me, the seven guys who want my self storage deal and make my life easy. And they mistake getting a fish or two for learning how to fish, what bait to use, where to fish, who to hire to fish for you, how to build a fish net, you know, where the waterfall is, where the fish will jump towards you versus you chasing them in the open water, not catching anything. The power of the knowledge could last you a lifetime versus me getting you even 20 investors. The people who raise $500 million a year, they still go to 300 investors a year to get the 15 closed. And they're the best on planet earth at raising capital. So even if I gave you 300 investors, you close 15, you got one deal done, not only would I need to charge you 15,000 a month retainer and take a big success fee, but it still wouldn't teach you how to do your next fund. You'd have referrals, you'd have momentum and credibility, but like it's still not as powerful as having the knowledge to do it yourself. People don't want to hear that. They want to go point A to point B, no pain, no cost, no suffering. And some people think, you know, for a $1,400 a year membership, are you going to connect me to all my investors and call them for me and set up the roadshow? And like, no, we're not. We're going to give you knowledge you can't get anywhere else to make your investor relations process robust and navigate the family office world. You'll meet a few investor leads. You'll get ideas on structure, strategy, 
And that mistake, whether you ever go to our website or think of us again, people should just know that, that mistake of looking for somebody to give them that handout lead, you, know, you can do that, but the real important thing is to figure out what your competitors are doing and what are they not doing. What do your investors want? What do investors complain about? What do investors, what are they thirsty for and no one's providing it to them? And where's that gap? And then where are your strengths and your DNA? Where are you excellent and what's growing fast? And the trifecta of those three things is a secret to making a ton of progress. And then if you can figure out where there's not a lot of competition, massive future demand, investors are very thirsty for strategy, a structure, et cetera, and what you can perform in and that intersection and narrow that down to one sentence to tell people why it matters that you exist on planet Earth as an investment organization. No one does those things that we said, and it blows my mind. Even to people in our program, we say, do these things. And then they send me these essay long emails that don't have a one liner, their pitch deck says Wilson Capital, you know, transformation every day. And you don't know if they're biotech or an angel investor club or a real estate fund. You gotta dig in and just figure out like, what are you doing? Like, why should I care? And you know, the busy people don't have time to do that. So I think that's something that almost everyone misses when they get started raising capital. I think, you, yeah, you said a, a lot of really good stuff there. If you just Start took a that, long answer. <laughs> no, it's perfect. That, that one, that one chunk of information, that, that intersection of investor complaints, investor demand, and then with that overlapping with what your competition is not doing, right? Preferably in a less right. crowded space and what you are naturally good at and, and well positioned to take advantage of. I mean, that's very difficult and rare to find, but I'd imagine if you could tap into that, that is you know, going to make your life so much easier. Right. And so many people pay $40,000 to some guru to be part of some mastermind or they pay, you know, plane tickets all over the place to look at deals and put down earnest money on deals. It costs nothing to do everything I just said. You don't need to join the family office club to do that. If you like that idea, we can give you 150 more ideas just like that. But like, you don't need to pay me anything. Just go do that. Make progress. And if you make money, then, you know, circle back in a couple of years and, you know, you can check us out. But you don't need to spend, you don't need to pay anybody to do that. It's just a meditational, being intentional about your value, doing your research, doing your homework. If you value your own time and money, there's no reason not to do that. So that's, that's the first step or the, the first piece of the puzzle, you know, we're, we're building our, we're building our fishnet and we're, you know, positioning ourselves, uh, you know, upstream and everything. So assuming we've, we've crafted our, you know, that, that intersection now, now we need to go and have those 300 meetings to close the 15 investors. Right. So right. what's the, so the next, so, so now I've got a good pitch, right? I need to go get 300 meetings. What's the best way for me to go get 300 meetings? Um, I would use the one liner in your voicemail, the top of your one page teaser. If you don't have a one page teaser, I'd go make that before trying to do anything. Um, I'd use it in the pitch deck on the front page of the pitch deck. While raising capital, I would use direct mail on those top 300 leads and send them a letter about having a meeting or a Zoom meeting. Um, I would make sure your materials are visual. So you glance at it and then 30 seconds, people get what you do. They see the one liner, they see the visual on your value add process, your bio that, you know, you, you have your, your bio and your, your image of your headshot there. Um, nobody, we review pitch decks for free for our members. We've reviewed 385 pitch decks. Not a single person has what investors have said over and over again on stage to have. And again, it costs them nothing. Everyone says, we would rather have an articulate two minute video from the founder saying, Hey, my name's Richard Wilson. You know, I run Centimillionaire Advisors and Family Office Club, and we help ultra wealthy families get access to direct investments and only charge a performance fee. If you want to check it out, there's no obligation. Just go sign up as an investor at privateequity.com and start as a client tomorrow or today. You know, I like just a short video to show like it's a human being that's articulate. He's saying his one liner, it's unique. They're professional. This looks like a human being I could do business with. It's so much more helpful than a 42 page pitch deck by itself or an HD image or just headshots. You can't see if the person can speak straight or is credible. And no one does that. Um, we have people at our events say, like we'll have a room full of 800 people and say, who here gets over a hundred emails a day? Everyone's hand goes up. And these aren't even famous investors like some of them are people just raising capital and they're still getting hundred emails a day. So imagine like an investor who's well known must get 500 emails a day. Then I said, raise your hand in the room. If you get more than two pieces of direct mail per month, 
not per day, but per month, that just add value, provide you insight on some topic, and no hands went up. No one wants to do that, that's lazy. What's easy, send a big email to a whole bunch of people, hope a percentage reply, and everyone does that, and they wonder why they don't get results. And, uh, Dan Kennedy always says, if you don't know what to do, do the opposite of everyone else. In direct mail, that's the opposite of everyone else. Text messages, get a much better reply, combining the video and texting a video to people who want to invest. Um, we had a nine days to raise $500,000 this last nine days, and we oversubscribed and, and brought in 650,000 using video, using text message. We didn't have time to use direct mail. Um, but those are some of the things to get a response is do what others are not doing and do what's gonna get engagement and get their attention. Yeah, that's a lot of good stuff. So in terms of communications, let's say a text message or a direct piece of mail, should I be doing that or should a sponsor be doing that even after the relationship has been set or is that for cold leads? You know, how, how does that fit into the funnel? I wouldn't text a cold lead unless it opted in for SMS on your opt-in form. You know, people might get mad or upset. Uh, so we're not that aggressive. For someone I've had a phone call with, or exchanged emails about a potential term sheet, I'll text them that video to help close them. With someone I've known forever and we text each other anyways, no big deal, uh, friendly investor. Um, so some level of interest has to be confirmed first, I think. Uh, so just be careful on that. For direct mail, uh, we're more aggressive on that. Um, for emails, we're kind of in the middle or more aggressive. Um, I think a lot of people don't wanna pick up the phone either. So I only get, maybe five to 10 voicemails a day, but I get hundreds and hundreds of emails. So again, I think taking the time to call, even knowing you're just gonna leave a voicemail, say, no, I just wanna reference my email. I know it's email. It's one email out of 702 that came in today. You can just search for the keyword here instead of calling me back because we don't know each other yet. Just search for this keyword, find my email. You just give it 30 seconds. Just let me know if this is a yes or a no. And um, you know, that could be a way to, to get more likely of a response. So that might be that might be helpful for people to hear too. So in terms of famous investors, not so famous investors, another thing about the family office space is some families are very private and family offices can be private as well. And so I think it, that can potentially be another reason why it's difficult to, to find them and network with them. And I think additionally, you don't know because of their privacy, you don't know what their strategies are. What are they investing in? Right. And so you don't want to be chasing down 300 family offices that none of them invest in what, you know, your self storage strategy. So how do you qualify your leads that, you know, really I'm speaking with family offices that invest in exactly the projects that I do. Yeah, that's really tough because um, a lot of families are private. Sometimes you just have to build those relationships, get exposure in front of groups of investors and some of them raise their hand and say, oh, I want some access to that. And like um, Dan Sullivan's one of my coaches and I was on his podcast talking about how we have a division that serves doctors and dentists. And I talked about doctor's family office and I had two doctors reach out and say, oh, I'm a doctor, you know, how could we work together? And, you know, having people raise their hand like that and come out of the woodwork is a great strategy and position yourself as an expert and then people will seek you out and find you and they'll want to invest with you because they were looking for the expert in MLPs or the expert in self storage, et cetera. Um, we teach a lot about that strategy because that's how I created my whole business. Like Centimillionaires is, uh, Centimillionaires.com is one of our websites for Centimillionaire advisors. And Centimillionaire means 100 plus net worth uh, individuals. And we chose that name because we want people who are 100 million plus to say, oh, the Centimillionaire Strategies book is the only book on planet Earth ever written just for me as someone who's worth 100 million plus and like be found. And no one uses that term now. Everyone's obsessed with billionaires, but there's 55,000 centimillionaires. We try to get ahead of that trend, cement ourselves so that we're found. And 13 years ago, people thought I was crazy starting the Family Office Club because no one talked about the term. And I could be dead wrong on centimillionaire. Um, people might go with hectamillionaire or never use either term. But... I believe in that idea, so I, I'm always trying to act on it myself and, and get ahead of the trend on that. The other way is to look at people who had exits in your space, people who are chairmen of publicly traded companies or on the board of a publicly traded company. They're a CEO of an Inc. 500 company. There's press releases out in every industry about someone being acquired or someone being bought out, and you can look up who the CEO is, and if the CEO has changed, perhaps, you can use um, a website. It's like a website archive 
service you can find on Google for free called Wayback Machine. And you can put any website in there and look at what was on the website five, 10, 15 years ago before they had the exit and figure out who that person was who had an exit. We've done things while looking at the healthcare industry, Inc. 500, historical rankings for the past 10 years. And then my admin will go and create a database of all the CEOs of every healthcare company for the last 10 years on the Inc. 500. Some of those have closed, some of them got bought out, some acquired others or went public. And now you have a database of people that are high net worth and know your industry and made their money in your industry. So the more you can find someone who's local to you, comes out of the woodwork because you got exposure or made their money in your space, you're gonna make more progress than going to strangers that don't know you, didn't come to you, don't know your industry, aren't local to you, aren't local to the investment, you're pretty much dead at that point. Like you're not gonna get it done and you're wasting everybody's time because you're gonna cold call people that have no interest in what you're doing and they can't easily learn about it, you know? Yeah, I learned that lesson, I think a couple of years ago. We had a deal that was, I wouldn't even consider it very complex, but just the level of investor that we were working with for this deal just didn't match the sophistication of the deal. And, and I learned that lesson that you definitely want your investor to match the deal. And having that imbalance, even if they have the capital, is just not going to be worth your time because they're right. going to be asking a million questions and they're not going to be the right questions that a real smart investor can cut right to the heart of the deal and, and ask those smart questions. So I, I appreciate working with investors that are on the same page or, you know, ahead of me. So, right. Perfect. So I want to touch on choke points, collateral and funnel, right? So you, you said some good right. things there. You said in terms of, you know, you want people coming out of the woodwork, you want people to see you as a thought leader or establish your expertise in what you're doing. Uh, so I think that's really powerful strategies. How do you recommend somebody build out their funnel? Just kind of briefly go from top to bottom. Yeah, sure. So the first thing is to know that trifecta space and know what you're going for and have that one liner. That's going to inform you on what investors are you trying to hit between the eyes? What investors do have those pain that pain the most? Who do you naturally have access to as investors? You can't build an effective funnel or even have an effective pitch deck or teaser if you don't know what investor you're targeting, because there's no way to craft something that's gonna be amazing um, to CalPERS or a sovereign wealth fund, but also amazing to the golf club, club guy next door. The golf club guy will have no idea what you're talking about because it's so sophisticated in so many terms and an overwhelming data room. He doesn't even know what a data room is. And the sovereign wealth fund will say, why are you wasting my time with this? We can't write checks for less than hundred million. Um, if you say, oh, we're going after all types of investors, it's just not very efficient or effective. So that's the very foundation of, of getting started. And we talk about this for five and a half hours at one of our workshops. So I'll try to do it like in three minutes, but basically when you have a funnel, top of the funnel, it might have, it doesn't matter if you say a thousand or 10,000 people a year going through it. But as you know, by having, you know, the show and the podcast, you have a thousand people up here. It doesn't take as much time to create a podcast as it does to write a white paper or write a book or put on a full day workshop. And it takes more commitment to meet with somebody one on one and actually invest your time to do that as an investor. So the more you go down the funnel, the smaller the numbers get. By correlated with that is it takes more work on your part to write the book, the white paper, do the full day workshop, meet in person, and just do a quick 30 minute interview or a 15 minute blog post or a social media update is like the very top of the funnel. Um, so more people will experience the things that don't take commitment on their part to digest the content. and They don't take a huge investment of your time to create the content. But the more they go deeper in your funnel, the more that they're showing they're serious. And the more that you have created that funnel, the more you're showing you're serious and committed and it qualifies them as an investor. The great thing is that if you do it right, it'll attract investors to you all day long and you'll have a flow of investor leads coming towards you or you'll be able to go to investor communities and use pieces of that funnel and you'll be more articulate on stage. You can pass out a book at the conference to everybody. You can be on other people's podcasts and talk fluidly about something that, that you're an expert in. And it, it helps you organize the information in your head and, and be able to add value to other people, including potential investors. So the goal is to attract investors to yourself. And some people might see a social media update about a book and then invest without ever meeting in person. Some people might come to a full day workshop and then seven years later, invest. One deal we're structuring, they've been on my email list up here for 11 years. 
and we met in person three times and now we're structuring the deal to invest in their, in their company. Other people are going to go through every part of the funnel many, many times and never invest or do anything. And then other people, if all that fails and it doesn't attract a single investor, if you build a basic funnel, your worst case scenario is now every single meeting you ever get with anybody, you're more credible, more of an authority. The meeting will probably go better. You've got better stuff to follow up with. You're more articulate. Like you can't lose by building the funnel. Even if your your ambition is like a greedy one of, oh, I want to raise a hundred million. So I'm going to build this master funnel to get those investors in and then add genuine value to them and get that hundred million raised. Like the byproduct will be, you'll become a relevant expert who's very well connected and articulate and genuinely more valuable to anyone, even if they don't invest with you. Cause you'll just be organized in information in the industry. And people don't want to do that work. But it's the way I build my business, so that's what I prescribe. There's other ways to get it done, probably with less work, honestly. I'm not smart enough to figure that out yet, but that's that's the way we operate and how we add value. Yeah, that's great stuff. It definitely does take a lot of work, but I I believe in the vision. So you, you mentioned a few of the pieces that would fit nicely into a funnel, a book, a podcast, uh, an, an all-day workshop. Can you give a couple more examples that you think maybe are – you know, maybe lesser known, but, but highly effective in your opinion? Yeah, sure. Uh, a whiteboard explainer video. You can see one. It, ex- it combines the idea of having a two minute video from the founder with a traditional whiteboard video where I say, Hey, I'm Richard Wilson. And, uh, if you, and there's a whiteboard behind me. Like, this is what I do. And I say my one liner and like, here, let me show you how we would add value. And I turn my chair and I go like this and start writing the first letter on the whiteboard. And it cuts to like some professional whiteboard guy. Cause I can't, you know, I haven't drawn anything since third grade. And then they do a professional job of showing our value add process in two minutes. And the whole video is four minutes. It's not super long. Um, it's real tricky and hard to get it under five minutes. And I wish I could have the video be only 90 seconds and communicate everything. I'm not that, that good at doing it yet. Um, but that's an example of something that should be part of your funnel. Uh, doing webinars are really valuable. Um, short interviews. I've done seven, 75 seven minute interviews with investors since the pandemic started. And we share all those on YouTube. We just hide the name for people that aren't a member. But I'm learning, growing my connections with investors, adding a resource for club members, and just doing a seven minute interview. You know, I can do way more of those. And the most value is, hey, what type of investor you are? What are you investing in? What's your number one piece of advice? And then the interview is over versus the normal kind of 45 minute or hour long interview. Uh, also, we limit our podcast interviews to 17 to 22 minutes, um, try to keep it snappy and get, you know, two done in an hour, get back to other work, et cetera. That could be helpful. And I've written a 550 page book. I've written 250 page books for Wiley a couple times for Bloomberg. And then I've self-published and I just I encourage people to self-publish and make the books not painful to digest. More people want to read your book at 80 to 125 pages. Then the 250 page book, they're like, ah, I don't want to travel with that too heavy. I don't know if I want to start that one. You know, the title of the book matters a lot. The title of everything, the white paper book video matters a lot, but there's no point in creating pain for yourself and everyone else. Just be more concise, have links to your website, get them to opt in and figure out who they are. If they bought the book randomly on Amazon, so they engage with you, send you an email to get a free resource. But making it concise and digestible, your most valuable investors don't have time to read a 550 page book. So you mentioned a data room earlier, and I'm sure some people aren't familiar with that. So can you quickly explain what a data room is? And and funny enough, I'm in the process of adding to mine and and cleaning it up. How do you, can you, can you kind of prescribe the, the home run data room? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Basically when you enter the data room, it's basically a, It could be as insecure, I'd like to say, as like a Dropbox room, or it could be something more sophisticated, some expensive software. Many people just use Dropbox. Um, But you'd have a a password protected area just for your serious investors. They go in there and they can see the purchase agreement for the asset, due diligence information, um, background information, offering documents, term sheets, et cetera. And the perfect data room would be very well organized as a Word document that says, read me first. And in just a few bullet points, it helps you guide them through the data room. Maybe it has a little video overview of how to navigate it because that takes three minutes to create. There's no reason not to. And then maybe it just has five to seven folders. Maybe financial modeling and pro formas in one folder. 
maybe background information and context on the sponsor or the investment firm and all their bios or, you know, um, one guy had a background in the FBI and he was claiming they had amazing due diligence and he was asking for ideas. I said, well, some people are afraid to ask to do background checks, like criminal background checks on other people. I think maybe it's rude or they just want to know, you know, just make sure they're not a felon or something, but they might be shy to ask. And I told him, if you really want to be transparent, do background checks on yourselves and put the background check in the folder. If you haven't been arrested 19 times, what are you afraid of? You know, like just do that. Nobody does that, but it would be a way to make it better than most. Most data rooms, you open it up, there's 19 folders. There's no explanation of what's what. There's a whole bunch of spreadsheets that are hard to read. And it's not that useful. It's like, okay, you can find a few things in there. Like, okay, here's a whole bunch of stuff. We're being transparent. But, you know, it's not thought through the really intelligent, like user-friendly mindset. And I think that would be very helpful to investors. They might not even know to ask for a data room, but the comfort level is going to go up. And I think your liability would probably go down a bit saying, well, we disclose that here and here and in the subscription documents you know i'm sorry if you didn't see that that was a risk going into it but we provided it to you in three ways not just one way you know yeah yeah i like what you said there also i think some people might look at it as obfuscation through massive information right they they say well right. if i just flood with all this information they're probably not going to scrutinize any one thing too much and i'll pass the test so right. uh that's I really like your, your read, you know, read me first idea that that makes a lot of sense. And right. in terms of a, a data room, uh, you, you kind of, we're talking more about a deal specific data room aside from the background check and things like that. But, uh, you know, I certainly think there's value in having just a, a company data room just to show, you know, here's what our reporting looks like. Here's our track record. Here's maybe some case studies, you know, what are some other right. things that could go into a, you know, corporate data room? Um, you know, maybe something that's a overview video of the, of the organization so that you can kind of go over all the stuff in the data room, just in, like the deal that we're closing right now, it wasn't about the company. It was on the deal. It was just a nine minute video. It just gave a 10,000 foot view, went into some of the top questions or concerns. You know, it could also talk about how to navigate the rest of the data room a little bit at the end of the video. Um, maybe talking about your, your team culture. Uh, and background, who other investors have been with you overall. Also, the number of deals you've done, like the more tangible you can make your one-liner and the more tangible you can explain things, the more people will cling to it and know it's credible. Because so you could say, we have a best-in-class team, but that's different than saying we have a 72-person team. Or you can say, we've served a lot of investors. Like, what does that mean, really? So you could say, we have 142 investors. Their average net worth is $7.4 million. And on average, they've gone into two and a half deals with us for $1.2 million. Like that just means so much more and just like loses credibility versus like they don't know otherwise. So you're on your first deal and you have two investors and they're both your parents or, you know, like people won't know. So I think that the hard numbers that would be in your one liner, you just want to kind of unpack those inside of the data room and the video and the overview information, I think. Yeah, definitely circling back to that one liner, which... I think I'm reading, I'm rereading the book, Start With Why, right? And that just really forces okay. you forget everything else and just really hone in on the why. And then all, everything kind of builds from there and it makes it all so much easier. Right. So uh, the, another thing that's on my mind, you, and you alluded to it earlier actually, was you were talking about helping people, you know, uh, get the right content, get the right message out there, hire the right people. And I think this is an interesting concept in the capital raising space, which is I think founders are extremely reluctant or, or some are maybe proud that they're the one handling all the investor relations. And, you know, as a founder, they're willing to give their cell phone number out and be on call and answer any investor questions. I personally don't think that's highest and best use of time. And I think you need to be conscious of your ability to scale. So what what do you recommend as you're growing your business in terms of bringing on help and really trusting an employee to handle those, you know, maybe first capital raising conversations? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, we have someone like that on our team named John. Um, he worked for eight years at Northern Trust, joined us to help bring on new clients into Family Office Club as charter members. But because of his background as we've been scaling our um, investor advisory platform. He's spending two to four hours a day now 
on investor leads. And what we've been doing is using him to get people from poking at the platform to registering and signing up to actively look at deals and qualifying people. That's an amazing use of time saved for me. Because someone sometimes signs up as an investor and then we call them. And they said they're an investor, but yeah, they're an investor of multifamily because they're syndicating multifamily, but they're not an investor that's just going to allocate as an LP. And so we're happy to have them on the family office five as a charter member, but they're not just a pure LP investor, right? So he qualifies a lot of those people. A lot of people see us, don't know if it's real, is the team real? He gets on the phone, you can tell them who's on the team, what we're doing, examples of deals closed. And he'll raise that credibility point where now they're ready to get started. He bridges that. That's an amazing use of time. Uh, some people just have questions and we have a way to become an investor client just online through some forms. And we don't take the capital online, but to become a client, it's online. And some people aren't comfortable signing a contract with someone they haven't had a phone call with, haven't talked to in person. So again, he gets them over that hump and helps follow up and it saves me follow up time. When it comes time to an actual deal getting done, in a live deal on our platform, I'm taking the brunt of that. And, you know, I'm facing that time challenge right now today, as we said before I started the recording. So um, for us, the crossing point is getting someone trained on all the first stage stuff I just talked about. If they do excellent and they can keep 100% busy with that, you might be able to graduate them then to getting them close to closing. And I just handle the whale clients, the tricky clients, the big ego clients, the really fast turn deals and he takes the ones who are going to invest under a hundred thousand uh, maybe or 75,000 or less uh, is really a different type of investor, 50 K or less a different type of investor where 75 K or more, you know, maybe I'd handle those as kind of a getting started stage for getting him more on board. But um, that's literally the process we're in right now and um, is going through that. But you have to do that over time, to your point. So eventually, the only thing you should be doing are the most important, the top 20%, they're going to provide 80% of the momentum. You know, that's where you got to be always as a business owner. That's going to change every quarter, every year if you're growing. You have to constantly be getting yourself out of what you're doing before, right? Absolutely. All right. Well, Richard, thanks so much for taking the time and providing tremendous value. I, I love the opportunity to ask some of my own personal questions that I'm going to take and I've got my notes. So I'll be, uh, be hopefully implementing some of this good stuff and uh, let people know listening uh, what the best way to find out more about Family Office Club yourself and, and get in touch if, if that's what they're looking to do. Yeah, sure. And I apologize for the, uh, the virtual background. It's not the best today. I was traveling, so it's not, uh, not ideal, uh, not as crisp, I know. Uh, but in terms of getting in touch and getting to know us, um, if you're looking to get better at raising capital, investor relations, family offices, you can just go to familyoffices.com. And uh, if you go to forward slash join, it's a dollar to try out the platform. If you don't like it, you wasted a dollar. If you're upset about that, we'll give you your dollar back. But, you know, we, we try really hard to add a ton of value so that we can do business together five years from now or you know, long term. Uh, that's the best place to check out if you want to learn more about Family Office Club. If you're just a straight investor and you're just looking to allocate, you're looking for direct investments, you like putting 25K to 25 million into direct investments, um, we have a platform called privateequity.com. We have 207 investors signed up and we help them get access to the best deal flow that we get by interacting with about 45,000 professionals a year through our, our 15 person team. So that'd be the best place to learn more. And our whole business model, just like you, is to give away more for free than our competitors do. So people can just get to know us on their own time schedule and engage when it's relevant and, and they're able to financially, whether that's today or, or next month or next year or whenever. And um, yeah, I think that'd be the best two places to check out. Sounds good. Thanks again. Cool. Thanks for having me here, Rob. Take care.